I'm curious about, uh, I'm curious about you said visualization. Uh, I feel like people are starting to talk about visualization a lot. I know you said you have a colleague that deals with hypnosis and stuff. Um, I've heard, you know, people can, can visualize playing the piano and the parts of the brain that, that use, uh, you know, play the piano will start to grow. Maybe not as much as someone actually sits down and plays the piano. I've heard of, you know, I think it's like the back in the thirties that the, the Germans, uh, in the Olympics, they had all of their runners go and run and then they visualized it. And they said that, that, you know, when they were at night, their brain was still doing the exact same motions and brain doesn't know the difference between every people are saying this like crazy now. And I'm, I'm curious the actual truth or non-truth behind it of when you visualize something, it is the same in your brain as when you're actually physically doing it. Yeah. So it comes close. So a couple of things. One is some people are very good at visualization. Some people are terrible at it. Uh, there's a guy that would, it sounds like I'm only mentioning Stanford studies, but he was at Stanford. Roger Shepard did beautiful studies. Um, on visualization, mm -hmm. um, spatial manipulating objects in space. So you might imagine a three-dimensional triangle, yeah. looks like a pyramid and flipping upside down. Some people can do that far better than others. Yeah. Some people can do that. They're just more auditory focused. Other people do that, uh, have more of a kinesthetic sense. Yeah. So some, um, which is a beautiful thing. Some people, um, I've had somebody tell me, a neuroscientist tell me, I think in feels, I'm like, what does that mean? <laughs> and, and they told me that when they feel something, they feel it first in their gut, then in their head. Some people feel it first up here. I think, I think we differ. That's, that's probably another point I should have made before is I think that sometimes the, the seesaw is tilted a little bit more towards mm -hmm. the body, sometimes a little bit more towards the brain. Some people are just literally more in their heads For sure. than in their bodies. Um, and animals, I think dogs are really wonderful because they do seem to be more like holistically connected. Mm -hmm. It's probably the first and last time I'll ever use that phrase, but holistically connected, because it doesn't really mean anything, but it, it does seem that they're very aware of how, of their body in space, because space is a big thing to dogs. Mm -hmm. Like who gets space is everything, because yeah. they don't think in terms of Bitcoins or US dollars or, you know, or euros. So space is the, is the unit of, of ownership, mm -hmm. right? So they probably think more in space units. Um, so, there's a, you know, I would say that there's a definite way in which certain people are going to be more oriented towards body stuff and certain people are going to be more oriented towards brain stuff. Mm -hmm. Some people are going to be better at visualization than others. Now, in terms of practicing something in mental rehearsal, there are some studies showing that mental rehearsal can improve actual physical performance. Mm -hmm. When you look at the brain in sleep, in particular in REM sleep, rapid eye movement sleep, and that's going to be the sleep that predominates in the second half of night. It's going to be associated with kind of emotionally rich dreams and this kind of thing. That sleep is when you replay events from the previous day and the previous day, especially if they have an emotional load to them. And there are beautiful studies that were done by Matt Wilson's lab at MIT um, showing that spatial navigation. So if you have to like, this is the first time I've ever been in this building. Mm -hmm. I'll go to sleep tonight. And in the second half of REM sleep, I'll bet you that the neurons in my brain that code like the relative position of this room, the restroom and the elevator and the parking lot, those are kind of the key elements I remember coming in. Yeah, You know, I know where they are relative to one another. Now tonight in sleep, my brain will decide whether or not it's important that I remember it or not. Mm -hmm. And that could be attached to whether or not something good or bad happened coming up from the parking lot, mm -hmm. or though going back to our earlier example, if suddenly there were an earthquake, we are in California after all, knock on wood, I'm a little bit superstitious. <laughs> if there were an earthquake, we're really you, high up. You can, yeah, we're really we're high screwed. up. We are way up here. You can bet I'm going to remember that sequence yeah. forever. Yeah. Because again, it's this highlighter on, on this whole experience. So visualization can be useful. Nothing is as good as actual practice. Yeah. The thing is visualization means you can get more practice. Now there's a, a tool that I think is perhaps more valuable that hasn't been discussed as much, which is the use of non-sleep deep rest or 20 to 30 minute naps, shallow, shallow sleep mm -hmm. after a learning episode. So this is a study that was published in Cell Reports. So Cell Press Journal, again, excellent journal. When I say that, I say that because um, they are great folks over at Cell Press Journal, but these are like carefully peer reviewed studies. There's no company that has a vested interest. These are funded by your tax dollars. And, and what they did is they had people learn a spatial memory task. So lights lighting up on a board. It sounds pretty simple. Remembering the sequence of lights, you get up to 20, 30 different light sequences, it's really tough. You have to think, you're thinking really hard yeah. and they create incentives, not electric shock incentives, but usually reward incentives. Either one works though. 
Then you put people into these shallow sleep naps, mm -hmm. what I also falls under the category of non-sleep deep rest. Mm -hmm. And you look at performance on other days, people learn much faster if they're importing a nap into their day or shallow sleep or what I call NSDR, non-sleep deep rest. So basically turning off the brain, yeah. just going into a, a kind of a spacey mode, no, not scrolling on Instagram, but just letting your mind wander and drift mm -hmm. or enter sleep, you learn faster because as we talked about before, that's when the synaptic rearrangements occur. Yeah. So that's a powerful tool for accelerating learning. Visualization can help, but for the 60% of people who have a hard time maintaining a visualization practice for more than a couple minutes, like mm -hmm. some people can do it for a few minutes and then their mind drifts, yeah. uh, the, probably the non-sleep deep rest is going to be the better tool. But for the, for the people that are very good at visualization, mm -hmm. they can see every motion that they need to take mm -hmm. in the actual performance. There, I think it's probably as good as physical exercise or close to it, yeah. at least in terms of stimulating plasticity. Yeah. But let's be fair to the process of plasticity. I can't sit there and think about, okay, 600 pound deadlift, 600 pound deadlift. Right. And like, you're not gonna get hypertrophy that way. Right. Although I'm sure people have tried. Yeah. yeah. So um, I'm curious when you're talking about the, the spatial recognition, I, I remember seeing a TED talk probably about four or five years ago, a guy talking about, first time I started really learning about neuroplasticity, he was talking about, um, they would take rats and, and they, I think what he said is they hooked an, a, an electrode up to their hippocampus, which, which, whenever it was re whenever it was going through and trying to find this cheese that they had, it would make like a ding, make a, mm -hmm. a, an auditory sound. Mm -hmm. And so he's going through and it's the ding. You can tell he's, he's, he's measuring it. And then he said, you know, then he's working late in the lab and all of them are sleeping and he can hear dinging. He forgot to turn it off, but mm -hmm. he could tell that. And is that right? That the hippocampus is the part where it's actually, they're, they're going through the entire maze again, as they're sleeping over and over and yes. over and over again. Yeah. So, and especially if there's a reward involved and for a rat in a laboratory, that's probably like the biz, biz, biggest experience, excuse me, ever. You know, that's like, that's a, that's a great day. Yeah. There's an exciting day, or <laughs> yeah. at least it's different. Yeah. Um, you know, it's, it's, you know, there, in the, uh, this calls to mind that in the nineties, there were all these experiments. Like if you give rats an enriched environment, there's all this brain plasticity, like yeah. give, and so people started putting their, playing Mozart to their kids and doing all this stuff. Yeah. So the stinger in this, it's kind of funny actually, cause it reveals how crazy we are. Um, as a species and how we're always trying to cheat the system, the biological system is that what they realized was there's no enhanced plasticity through these enriched environments. Playing Mozart to your kid is not going to enhance their brain learning at mm -hmm. all. Mm -hmm. What they realized is that normally these rats are in a deprived environment. You just destroyed so you, an entire a company that, 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 that just plays baby Mozart for all the babies. <laughs> no, well, yeah, we're the, I mean, although I will say that baby shark thing that yeah. my friends play their kids, it must trigger a lot of epinephrine because I heard a ton it once. Of studies on that before they and that it. thing is, I mean, I can hear yeah, it now. That's in your yeah, head. the earworm thing is a whole <laughs> other business. But, you know, the, this idea, if you deprive an animal or a child, I mean, obviously that's horrible. Yeah. Then you set the threshold for changing the brain really low because they're essentially in a black box. Yeah. Right. I mean, sadly, in the earlier part of the last century, there were, there were people that did this, right? the Harlow monkeys experiments. These are bar frankly were barbaric experiments, mm -hmm. hopefully never to be ever done again, where you deprive animals of emotional contact or warmth. You give them a wire monkey mother is horrible, right? Mm -hmm. But what it, what you, that's a deprivation experiment. Mm -hmm. And so what we're talking about is normal experience and then moving up from normal experience. Mm -hmm. And there is such a thing as normal experience. Like sure, things vary, one parent, two parent, primary caretaker, et cetera. But most people aren't in this black box deprived environment. So the point is that if you want to change the brain, you have to give it a really strong stimulus. Yeah. For most people, you have to give a really strong stimulus. There's never been a case ever throughout human history, no reported case of somebody who had lifelong childlike neuroplasticity. Hmm. But there have been elements of childlike behavior. I don't mean childish. I hope there's a different, a real mm -hmm. difference there. Um, where adults have managed to tap into the plasticity process more readily. And those include things like an element of play, like mm -hmm. the great physicist Richard Feynman was famous for bongo drumming on the roof. He did it naked, but nowadays that would get you fired. So that's not good. These should be ethical, age appropriate, context appropriate, species appropriate behaviors, right. of course. But he was bongo drumming on, naked on the roof of Caltech, or he, he became quite good at sketching and painting later in life. 
Mainly, he claims, we don't know exactly what his process was, by embracing an element of play and kind of lightheartedness about it, mm-hmm. which presumably gave him a pers- the dopamine and the perspective on the agitation. Mm-hmm. Or maybe he learned to bypass agitation. But when you're, ve- I should say, when you're very playful about something, that means that the contingency is usually pretty low. Mm-hmm. Like he already had a Nobel Prize. Maybe he had two. But anyway, he at least had one. And he already had a full career. So Drawing for him was about, oh, wow, he's also a pretty good painter, Mm -hmm. but he wasn't a Rembrandt, right? right? So, and he didn't need it. So it's understandable. And I think people would be well to adopt the idea that the agitation is a prerequisite for learning and getting Mm -hmm. better. Now, if you're doing something for fun and recreation, then you can adopt an element of play. And as you get better at things, occasionally adopting an element of play can be really good. But there's a reason why I think in that uh, documentary, The Last Dance, mm-hmm. the, the Jordan Michael documentary, Jordan, yeah. I mean, he's a serious guy, right? He went at basketball with, if 110% is possible, he gave it 110%. And mm-hmm. Apparently he went at everything that way. Yeah. So for him, it wasn't a game. Nothing was a game. Mm-hmm. It was about winning. That's where his dopamine came from. You can do that, or you can be about purely about process. But as we mentioned earlier, you, I think it's always going to be best to be about both process and outcome, mm-hmm. because otherwise you're, you're divorcing yourself from, you know, the opportunity to really, you know, level up and the, the more resources you gain also the more that you can share. Those could be monetary resources. Those could also be knowledge-based resources. Yeah. So in any event, um, learning for learning's sake is great, but learning for learning's sake and doing something with the information 